Welcome to Hard Talk. I'm Stephen Sacker. The oil price crash has put fossil fuel producers under huge pressure. Profits are evaporating. New exploration looks like a massive gamble. And to cap it all, world leaders are now committed to a radical decarbonization of the global economy. Tough times for my guest today, Francis Egan, boss of Quadrilla, the company leading the charge to bring fracking to the UK. Do the realities of economics, politics and environmental concern mean fracking has lost its appeal? Francis Egan, welcome to Hard Talk. Thank you. This is an incredibly negative climate for a business such as yours, isn't it? Well, uh, there are pluses and minuses, like any time in any industry. Uh, obviously, the, as you said in the introduction, the oil price and the gas price are close to historic lows. And still uh, sinking, it looks. Uh, well, still dropping. I don't know if sinking is the right word, but certainly dropping. Um, but, of course, we're in the uh, fortunate, unfortunate position, uh, we're not a producer, uh, so it doesn't really impact us from a revenue point of view. Well, we, that's we a very, are very interesting way of putting it. Uh, You're not a producer because you are, a, in a sense, a speculative company that's all about exploration, trying to find new reserves, indeed, in your case, new reserves that you can frack. But that's all, almost the worst place to be because you need to convince investors it's worth taking a punt on the future. And why would they? Well, because they already have, in our case, so we already have investors on board. Uh, we've already drilled wells, albeit in, in better times, but uh, price-wise. Uh, but, of course, in drilling those wells, we have proven that there is an enormous quantity of gas under the ground in, in Lancashire. In fact, the British Geological Survey subsequently confirmed it extends across to the entire uh, north of the UK. So we have taken a lot of what we might call the technical uh, risk out of it, except for one very important uh, challenge, which is to demonstrate that the quantity of gas in the ground can be made to flow out of the ground, which is where we're at in the exploration process. Right, which is a technical challenge, but there's also a major sort of business model challenge, because if the price continues to go down, it is going to cross a threshold where however much there is in the ground, it's not going to be economic for you to bring it out. Well, I, I've been in the oil and gas industry long enough and 30 plus years to know that oil prices go down and like everything else in the commodity world, oil prices come up. Uh, but and the I, timing's crucial. I mean, I'm sure you know better than me, the Department of Energy here has just slashed its projection of gas prices going forward to 2020. We're not talking about a blip here, we're talking about a new reality. Well, uh, again, uh, I would be a little cautious about new realities because I remember the, you know, the uh, super cycle model when iron ore prices were never going to go down, which was the new reality then, and now we have another new, new reality, which is that the oil price will never come back up again. What, what I would say is that what, what's actually happening, which is I think sh is a concern and should be concerned for the UK, is that uh, North Sea production, uh, some of the highest cost production uh, in the world is being very badly hit uh, and I think is not going to come back unfortunately in, in what disappears over the next couple of years. You know, you can see how resilient uh, fracking and shale was in the US. The Saudi Arabia undertook this strategy of opening the taps in order to drive ostensibly mm. US shale out of the market, and it stayed resilient to 50, 40, 30. Now we're down to 20, but we will undoubtedly see shale uh, production declining in the US, but equally, it's easy for it to come back on because it's low capital investment and it doesn't cost a lot to turn it off, and it doesn't cost a lot to turn it off. We will not see the North Sea coming back on. Well, I do want to talk more about the, the international perspective later, but I want to stick for the moment with your business model. You're a company that's committed to what I'm going to call throughout this interview fracking, which no, is fine, the ex exploitation yep. of gas reserves and sometimes oil as well by yep. hydraulic processes in rock yep. uh, way underground. That's what you do. And you say, well, look, you know, our, sp our investors are already in for the long term. We know the gas is under the rock yep. and we can pull it out. But I come back to this point about uncertainty. It's not just about price. It's also about the, the sort of political climate. The uncertainty for you is that most people in Britain, certainly the communities where you want to frack, do not want you there. 
And that's a big problem for you. Well, it would be were it true, uh, but it's not the case. I mean, I spend a lot of time, as you might imagine, in Lancashire, uh, and I certainly don't deny that there are people who are opposed to it. But I talk to a lot of people who are for it. I talk to a lot of business people who are for it. I talk to a lot of unemployed people in Blackpool who are for it. And if you look at the actual data, um, you look at the polling, what you'll find is that there is a small group of vociferously uh, opposed people, about mm -hmm. 20%. There is an equally sized group of people vociferously in favour. The vast majority of people in the UK have yet to make up their minds. So well, you're not, not reading the same polls as me. You yeah. have polled, the, one, the most recent one I've seen so shows a significant shift of the national public opinion, the mood, against fracking. 43% say shale gas extraction should not happen in the UK. 29% are in favour, and that's a big shift against. Well, I, haven't, I have not seen those numbers, because the numbers that I have seen uh, consistently have shown uh, the majority uh, have yet to make up their minds. Um, and Well, uh, let's, uh, let's uh, not talk polls, then. Let's yeah. just talk reality. Uh, uh, yeah. As you've said, your focus right now is in Lancashire, northwest of, of England. You believe there's a very significant gas field in the rock there. But the democratically elected local council have considered everything that you want to do and they just refuse to give you the planning permissions that you need and that's democracy in action they're elected by the people and they are telling you you can't operate yeah the, the planning process is rightly as you say a democratic process uh, we went through that in in lancashire interestingly we uh, ticked every single box on all the safety and environmental issues uh, and it's correct to say that they turned it down but not on grounds of safety environment emissions water or any of the things that you might read about or hear about on the tv uh, they turned it down what I might, I might call, not, they're not unimportant, but they're fairly traditional planning issues of traffic and noise. So it, uh, clearly uh, we did not get approval, but the planning process is, it takes account of, of the local needs as it should, but also the national need, and that is why we, are, we have and are appealing. The planning uh, officers themselves recommended approval, and the council's own legal department recommended right, approval. Right, but it's this point about uncertainty again. You know, we talked about the prices, we'll talk in a minute about environmental concerns, but it, just in terms of politics and planning, you, I read an interview with you uh, a year, a year and a half ago, where you said, you know, I'm sure, I'm sure that we will be fracking in Lancashire by the end of 2015. Well, here we are in 2016, and there's still no sign of you getting the green light. Well, I, I'm amazed that I said I'm sure, because I've been in the oil gas business long <laughs> enough to know that surety is a, is a real you were overwhelmed with optimism <laughs> on that particular but, day. But what I would say is that I, I know, you know, uh, the, the argument that there's political uncertainty, that there's price uncertainty. Well, welcome to the oil and gas business. That's the world we live in. There is nowhere in the world where you can explore for and produce oil and gas that there isn't political uncertainty mm. or and or price uncertainty and and some of the places you have to go if you can't develop your own indigenous resource such as the Middle East North Africa Russia are, are, have a lot more uncertainty and and what I would say is do we really want to be wholly reliant for our energy resources on them it's fine now while it's cheap and 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 plentiful that won't be the case always no but uh, you've already talked about the United States I mean shale exploration production has revolutionized the energy market in the United States they've got a glut they've got so much oil and gas they don't know what to do with it almost and they are prepared to sell quite a lot of it into Europe and into the UK which again changes the calculation do we really in a very densely populated land unlike Texas or North Dakota where they've got these vast tracts of empty land where they can do their fracking we don't have that. Do we need to frack when we can actually buy liquid natural gas, get it tanked over from the United States? That's the new reality. So, well, let me say just two things about that, if I may. Um, the first, there is this, what I might call an urban myth, that all this is happening in, in the United States in some kind of, you know, unpopulated frack park where nobody lives. If you look at the Environmental Protection Agency study, the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency study, study. The stats in there are that in 2013 there were 9 million people in the US living within one mile of, a, of at least one hydraulically fractured well. 9 million. And there were seven or 8,000 public sources of water supply within one mile of hydraulically fractured well. So it's not the case that the US this is somehow no, all happening out what's in, the, interesting, in the desert. In one of those areas where there is quite dense population in a field, a frack field, New York State, in that eastern, very big eastern uh, gas reserve in the rock, New York State has decided to ban fracking because they, they believe they believe that the the health uh, the public health issues are so uncertain so many to quote them red flags that they've put a ban on it which is uh, you know uh, uh, quite correct and and gets a huge amount of publicity and you've repeated it again and nobody talks about the 23 states in the u.s where it's been going on for the last 10 years with with no uh environmental or um uh, health 
um, repercussions, lots of allegations. Well, okay. There isn't a single case in the US, and let me just finish this point, mm. not one case in the US where a public water supply has been contaminated, interfered with, or impacted by fracking. Not one. And in this country, we, our water is supplied by 99% of our water comes from public water supplies. In 10 years, hundreds of thousands of wells, millions of fractures, no impact on US public water supply. Well, let us unpick, and you know, I think you've now brought us into the various environmental arguments about the wisdom of, of fracking. Let's get into some of them. You talk about water. Let me just quote to you from the Journal of Epidemiology and Community Health, an article by Dr. Madeleine Finkel. This is based on research in New York. The available science raises substantial questions about the harm to health. People living near drilling sites are presenting with symptoms, for example, skin rashes, nausea, abdominal pain, respiratory difficulties, headaches, dizziness. I could go on, there's many more. These, they say, demand further investigation. Now, and I would say that is entirely typical of the um, claims against fracking. There is not one single fact that links any of that to fracking in what you said, and I suspect if you read the paper, would be likewise. I have seen dozens of those. Um, and it's very easy, in fact, uh, almost too easy, to make assertions of negative health outcomes. Mm. If you want to claim a positive health outcome for a product, you have to jump through enormous hoops tests, blind tests. You can't put a drug on the market and say it's going to cure cancer and not go through all that. You can put a study out there and say, fracking killed my cat, and that's it. there is increasing evidence. It's, yeah, but there's you know no what? data. This is, this is the Journal that. of Epidemiology and Community Health. Now, I'm not a regular reader of it, but I dare say it's highly respected in the United States. Yeah. So is the Environmental Protection Agency. They looked at Pavilion, Wyoming, not a place I know myself, but they have investigated allegations that fracking has affected the drinking water there, there and they say that more investigation is needed. Well, uh, the, if you looked at the conclusions, and I think the Environmental Protection Agency studied 38,000 or so wells for over five years, and they concluded that there is no evidence of systemic pollution to U.S. drinking water supplies, and I'll say again what I said a minute ago, there isn't a single case of public water supply being impacted in the U.S., and I'll be glad to be corrected if, if someone can point to one case where a public water supply... And why would yeah, there the be... The problem frankly, here, I mean, the New, York, the New York Public Health Commissioner, he basically said, look, I, I wouldn't want my kids to be brought up next to a fracking site, and, and that isn't that part of the problem. It's easy for you, as the chief executive of the company, so committed to fracking, to tell people it's safe, but when I tell you that there are serious doubts from community is right next to fracking sites, you seem to dismiss their fears. No, I, I'm not dismissing their fears. Uh, don't get me wrong. I think the fears are absolutely and obviously genuine. Uh, and I'm not surprised with the degree of scaremongering that goes on around this, frankly. But if you look at the data as opposed to the assertions, it's not supported. In, here in the UK, we, uh, we would be injecting water, sand, and one non-hazardous chemical at depths of 8,500 feet into rock through an 8-inch hole, uh, miles away from public water supply sources. Methane is not a contaminant. You cannot contaminate groundwater with methane. Most groundwater already contains methane. And we don't... I think there is a perception somehow in the UK that, that the, the aquifer is some sort of pool of Evian that you, you drill into and the water comes into your tap. Water comes out of the, the, the ground, often containing methane, goes into a treatment plant which extracts it and lots of other things besides, and then goes into the public water supply. Yeah. There is little to no risk. But, but what we're if ignoring I can stop is. You for a second. It's yeah. just, you know, in the end, it comes down to how much an independent investigation is required before there can be certainty here about some of these health issues. I mean, celebrities from Paul McCartney to Vivian Westwood, when you were trying to frack in, in Sussex, or at least to drill in Sussex, uh, they launched a public petition saying that they didn't want any of this to go ahead until there had been the most rigorous independent investigation, which they claim in the UK has never happened. Are you prepared to back that? Well, it, you'll forgive me if I, if I think that the energy policy of the UK shouldn't be driven by Paul McCartney. I have a, I have a huge respect for his music, but, 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 but uh, or the, Vivian the, Westwood the for that matter. The reason that matters <laughs> is because we talk public opinion. Public opinion, as I've said, is moving against you. You have to address the degree to which this is now in the public domain. And the, the question is whether you're prepared to accept 
a thoroughgoing, rigorous, independent investigation of this area of uncertainty. Well, let me, let me answer that and then maybe talk a little bit uh, because we rarely get the chance about the benefits of, of fracking. So, uh, there already, so uh, there already has been. You know, the Royal Society, the Royal Academy of Engineering, two of the most respected institutions in the UK have done that. Public Health England have done that. The Environment Agency studied the permits for which we want to, uh, or for which we applied for activity in Lancashire for 12 months plus. They concluded there was no risk to health or to water supplies and gave us the permits we needed. And as I said, Lancashire County Council turned the applications down not on any health or safety or environmental issues, but on the grounds of noise and, and traffic, which are important, but they're not what we've been talking about. Now, set against that, the country's running out of gas. We are literally running out of gas. We will well, be entirely uh, we, reliant. You know, we've just talked about the lowest gas price it, it, so for, for not, many, many years. Yeah. We've just talked about the degree to which Britain now, if it wants to, can import liquid natural gas from all over the world. W where's this gas shortage? Well, uh, the gas shortage is in the UK. And of course you can import liquid natural gas. But there's two things about that. One, you are reliant on where you're supplying it from. So well, all you, over the world, because frankly, well, it's not all over the there's world. a glut in the world. I mean, yeah, that's why the price is coming down. This is the market. Yes, but it's not that straightforward to take gas... Trans transform it into a liquid, put it on a ship, ship it halfway across the world, transform it again back into gas, and then take it to, the, to, to your house or my house. Plus, not only is it not straightforward, it's expensive, and finally, and lastly, but not least, it's, it's hugely environmentally unfriendly compared to producing it n next to the source of demand. Mm. The, 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 the environmental requirements for LNG have been shown in terms of CO2 emissions to be two to three times what, what uh, domestically produced well, gas I, I, I guess then we ought to come to the other huge issue facing you guys at the moment, which is the, 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 the climate change agenda and the degree to which it makes sense to contemplate another attempt to tap into the reserves of fossil fuel under the ground when political leaders across the world have committed for the first time really to a serious and wholesale decarbonisation of the world economy. Well, can I uh, come back a, a little to, to why you would be doing, wanting to do that? I mean, I've talked about the security supply, which is not a, not a trivial issue. I know you, ca you can, in theory, rely entirely for your energy supply uh, on imports, but it's not, a, it's not a position that many countries feel comfortable about doing, and the US certainly didn't feel comfortable about doing, which, which is why they got on to do this in the but first I mean, place. Even your and former chairman, Lord Brown, has said, you know what, if we do or do not develop our fracking natural gas resources in the UK is going to make no difference to the price of gas inside the UK. Well, so, you know, the gas is going to be available to be bought at pretty much the same price whether we frack in the UK or not. Well, I, I admire your faith in Lord Brown's price forecasting ability. Well, you but, presumably but, admired him because he was chairman of your company. Well, I certainly admired him. He has achieved enormous things in the oil and gas industry, but uh, I think he himself would admit that forecasting the oil and gas price is a mugs game. Um, no, nobody he forecasts the current about price. A specific price. He was just talking about the concept. Whether or not you tap into the... You say huge, but frankly, huge. in world terms, limited resource. Well, we're not talking world terms. We're talking about... Well, we're talking about global gas prices, no, aren't we? No, we're talking about developing gas for the UK market. Now, I know you, you, you're putting forward the theory that you can you know, switch on an LNG plant and pop it on a ship and transport it from Algiers to Blackpool you know, and flick of a switch. You can't. Gas is not actually as transportable as you might think it is. It requires a huge amount of capital investment to do that. So you do develop local pricing. You've seen it in the US. Why is the price of gas $2 in the US and $10 in Japan if it's so easy to transport gas from one country to another? Yeah. It's not. So we should not, in my mind, we would be, it would be irresponsible for us not to even look, not to even explore our own natural resources. Well, I, I understand that, and it's taken us back to an issue of markets and prices, but let's get back to climate change. Because, you know, I'm sure you watched events in Paris just like the rest of us yeah, did, and you yeah. must have got the message that, you know, I, it is time to accept that a lot of the fossil fuel on this planet needs to be left so in so the ground. Let's talk about that. I mean, uh, you will be well aware that at the moment in the UK about 85% of our energy is fossil fuels and, and that's reflected, uh, comes from fossil fuels and by energy of course it's not just electricity, it's transport and uh, heating as well. And that's about the same globally if you look at the, uh, at the global supply and demand of energy. 85% uh, comes from fossil fuels, the rest comes from a mixture of renewables, nuclear, etc. So um, uh, absolutely there, there is a desire and intent, and I understand why, to move from 85% 
to 0%. But you can't move from 85% to 0% in the flick of a switch. And all fossil fuels are not equal, to misquote George Orwell. And, and we should not make you know, the perfect the enemy of the good. We should not say the perfect situation is we have all renewables. Gas is good. Well, Natural up to gas, a point, it's very you know, good. Well, it's, it's, is there, there are it's people good. like Friends of the Earth, there are Greenpeace, Dr. Jeremy Leggett, who I'm sure you know well, the, the, the solar guy, they all say there's significant evidence that the methane leakage that comes with what you do is so severe, or potentially so severe, that it could make, could make fracking as damaging to uh, emissions as coal-fired, you know, coal-fired You know, that, I think that is based on one study out of the U.S., which is, and that has, that has been studied at, at length here by uh, Dr. Mackay, who is DEX chief scientist, uh, and he concluded that fracking is, uh, fracking, natural gas produced from fracking is broadly the same as natural gas produced from conventional oil, oil reservoirs. And why wouldn't it be? It's, it's, it's well, you can quote your studies, I can quote mine. There's, again, we come back to uncertainty. There's a well, degree of uncertainty, uncertainty about how no, much no, methane I, I, I would take your issue. operations are going to put into the atmosphere. No, I, I would take issue with you there, because there is one study, and there are innumerable other studies contradicting that. I don't think anybody reasonably actually accepts that now. I think that argument has been completely debunked. So there your argument to me, or well, not to me, but to the world is, you know what, we accept that we need to be moving to a decarbonized economy. We need to be moving to a fully renewable, sustainable economy. But in the meantime, give us permission to bring out of the ground vast amounts of new fossil fuel. Does well, that make sense? My argument to, to you and to, to anybody else, frankly, is we need natural gas in this country. There are people around this country watching this now who have the central heating boilers turned on. 85% of the UK uses gas for heating. 60-odd percent uses it for cooking. We are not going to be stopping using natural gas in this country for decades. The, de the Department of Energy and Climate Change have come down. The Climate Change Committee have forecast the same. There will be natural gas used in the country. No question. The only question is, where are we going to get it from? I repeat, I think it would be irresponsible not to even look bearing in mind we're at the exploration phase, not to even explore and see, can we produce that gas under the ground safely, environmentally responsibly? We're talking about a handful of wells to assess that. And we're not even going to look at that, and we're going to import it from Algeria and Russia. So what then do you need to happen? Because I come back to the ambitions you've had and the way they've been thwarted. You know, you hoped now to be operating in Lancashire. You're not, because you're not allowed to. Is it, in your view, a political failure, a failure of will to, to get this moving, or what is it, and what needs to happen? Well, I think it's like uh, anything new, in a way, particularly anything new going through planning, and, and uh, fracking is certainly not unique in this way. We've seen it with Heathrow, we've seen it with HS2, you see it with any infrastructure development is it's a slow process to get started and until you get started you're open to all these assertions that it'll do this it'll do that and it's very hard to, to disprove an assertion when you can't point to anything actually happening. No I suppose the question is whether in the end you know and, and Mr Cameron Prime Minister he said that you know he wants to go for it when it comes to fracking in the end is this an issue in your view that is too important to be allowed to be blocked by local democracy. Well, I, I think, you know, uh, we don't have a, what I've described as a pick and mix democracy. You know, you don't take the bits you like and discard the bits you don't like. So we've been through the local planning process. We've achieved a lot through that. As I said, we didn't achieve all the approvals, but we ticked a lot of boxes going through that. But it is an issue of national importance, which is why the Secretary of State has called it in, which is why he said he's called it in. We're not the only ones to get called in. They call in about 100 of these a year through the, the, the whole uh, you know, spectrum of industries. But clearly it's an issue of national importance. It's... It, it's it would be, I'd go back and say it again, it would be irrational, I think, of us not to even explore our own resources. How long will you give this before you give up? Well, I don't have any intention of giving up soon. Uh, you've, you've quoted me, I, I hope you've misquoted me as saying that we would be sure to be fracking by the end of 2015. <laughs> but I intend to see this to see this through because we, we need to drill and see whether this can be technically produced. We have always been up front and said we don't know that yet. All right. Well, we'll come back and revisit this when you know for sure. But Francis Egan, for now, thank you very thank much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much.